Our gospel for this Sunday in Lent comes to us from the second chapter of the gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. One of the odd things about the year of Mark in the lectionary is we often get a lot of John thrown in. Um, And so we end up with a story from John in the midst of everything else. And this one is, you know, kind of unique. It's one of those stories that appears in the other gospels as well. But in the Gospel of John, what transpires happens at the beginning as opposed to right at the end of Jesus' ministry. This happens at the start, not the finish. He's in Jerusalem, having just came from the wedding at Cana. And here he um, does something pretty dramatic. The Passover of the Jews was near and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. They then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise you, Lord. Please be seated. All kinds of jarring things that can happen. It's like all of a sudden, wait a minute, what's going on? Well, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. He's just, he had an interesting experience over uh, Valentine's Day and everything else like that. He met this uh, professional bowler, and he fell really hard for her. He found her quite striking. But then he found out that she was already engaged to someone else, and he found out he was just the spare. <laughs> Almost left him in the gutter. <laughs> one, of my, you know, one of the nice things about Lent, I know there's a couple of you that are really about it, and I know Sandy is one of them, my wife is another, um, Priscilla I think is another one. Purple is a favorite color, right? You know, I do like purple. I like it more than red and blue combined. Now, one of the things that more and more people are doing less and less of is using cash. And it's kind of fun sometimes when you actually use cash, how some people react, um, and things like that. I went to some place, and the bill was like $18 and change. And the only cash I had on me was a 50. And I gave them a 50, and they're like, I'm sorry, we can't take that. Do you have anything smaller? So I handed her a $25 bill. Mm-hmm. Actually, one time, right after college, um, on Guam, I was working for a person who was in the Lutheran Church of Guam, and it would think of it like this, as like office depot that, by delivery, you know, kind of stuff. Uh, office supplies, stationaries, all that kind of stuff, and we delivered all the paper and all that. Back in the day when you had dot matrix printers, and you had those little things you had to tear off the side, yeah, that, yeah, mm-hmm, yes. Um, and one day... There was an officer from the Guam Police Department at, talking to my boss about, he was asking him some questions because recently there had been a rash of counterfeit money that had been showing up. And he's like, Dave, take a look at this. And I walked in and the guy looked and said, what do you make of this? He said, oh, someone took a bag of rocks and 20 pound, bill, and 20, you know, in regular uh, carbon, you know, regular paper and printer paper and printed something out and ran it through the, di- ran it through the uh, laundry a few times. And the cop's sitting there taking notes. <laughs> and, and I'm like, what? He's like, um, yeah, there's all of these all over the place and are wondering how they do it. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> Didn't I tell you the reason I'm in Tucson is witness protection? <laughs> Don't tell anyone online, okay? That's all I got to say. No. Yeah. 
But these things, you know, when it comes to money, we can get somewhat crazy about it. And you think about all the different kinds of money. You know, you go overseas, you see all the different, you know, colors and shapes and sizes of different things. It's a great way to, you know, be able to tell the difference between a five and a hundred because the shape, the size is different. Here it's like, mm, okay. But what do you do when you travel overseas and you got to change your money, right? There's an exchange rate. And sometimes it's in your favor. Sometimes it's not so much. And you have to pay the convenience fees and all that kind of stuff. Now imagine arriving into church and someone would greet you and say, you know, your money out there doesn't count. We need it in a specialized form. And just for the simple price of $25 for every $50, we'll charge you that $25 and then the $50, and I'll give you $50 back. Isn't that a deal? It's almost half off. <laughs> Great math, huh? That's one way to balance the church budget. Wait a minute. <laughs> Write that down. you imagine what that would be like, though? That you had, to do, you had to go through something like that. Now, what would happen if you're someone who cannot afford that much money? Or, I'm sorry, the clothes you are wearing is not suitable because it's not Sunday best according to us. We have these wonderful selections of clothes for you that you must choose from. I don't care what you're wearing. And of course, there's a fee. Now some of you, it might make your Sunday mornings a lot faster. It doesn't matter what I wear, that's it. But again, what are we saying? That was the way the temple operated, though. And in many ways, it was because of the realities of their religious practice in the midst of an occupying nation. The money that was the common currency was Roman. It had Caesar's head on it. Now, in the first lesson, you might have heard a reason that that was not allowed in the temple. Graven image. That was a problem. Okay, so that makes sense. The other thing is that, again, the temple was a center of sacrifice. And throughout Leviticus and Deuteronomy, all that, you have all of these rules, and okay, here's, you know, you do X, you do Y, and you're absolved. It was a wonderful little transaction that happened there. And it gave people comfort in the sense that for once they were told, if this is what you needed to do, then you were done. It wasn't a case of, well, I don't know, did you have enough faith? Did you pray enough? Did you give enough? There was no question of enough. Here's the, basically, it's like, here's the chart. In its own way, that is comforting because it gave closure. And it was an expectation of people to pilgrimage there. And if you were closer, to be there more often. But if you're traveling any distance, are you going to travel with your animals needed for the sacrifice? How complicated is that? What happens if you lose them? What happens if they die along the way? just much less taking care of them. All the way to Jerusalem, it was a nice, practical offering to have these there. Now, of course, the fact that somebody was making money off of it and someone was getting a kickback off of it, and what would happen if you didn't have enough shekels to be able to get the animal you needed, again...
that causes a problem. When Jesus challenged the system, he challenges it on many levels. Yes, when he did this, he really torqued off the powers that be. Because guess who was getting rich off of it? The temple leaders. They were the ones making the money off of this. Of course, yes, it went on to hopefully pay for the temple, but like all civic projects, it was still being built after 46 years. Kind of like the 10. <laughs> so he challenges them, their place, their power, their economics. But he wasn't just challenging them, he was also challenging the Pharisees and all of their assumptions on what was righteousness and what was not. Are you going to have the zeal for the law? You're going to do all of these things? Yep, you better, you better do it all. Great. But are you using that to get closer to God or separate people from God? The clean, the unclean, the righteous, the unrighteous, those people... Please note that they have discovered part of you know, what was on the outside of the temple, which is the engraving that basically said, you know, the temple mount, all Gentiles found beyond this sign are liable to be executed. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, all are welcome was not, an issue, was not a thing for them. You, just ha you had to be a Jew. But then again, you also had to be a male Jew of a certain age without physical defect in order to get all the way in. And so, what money you had, who you were, what you did, everything else, and your capacity to be able to get in were all impediments to God. And the thing that really got Jesus mad, please notice, folks, this, you know, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. He kicks over tables and flogs people left and right. Okay, admittedly, it needs some work. But it seems like, wait a minute, who, whatever happened to Minnesota nice Jesus? But that's because, let's face it, folks, as he would even go to the Pharisees in their face and call them whitewashed tombs and blind guides. These are not friendly things to say to people. But what they were doing and how they were operating was dividing people from God because, well, they didn't measure up. And with power... Political power and economic power and temporal power, that's what got Jesus killed. Because he challenged the status quo. Because the status quo was about who was in and who was out, and are you worthy? And yet the beginning of the Gospel of John talks about this in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and, and the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. God came to us. Do you think that might be something we should pay attention to? Especially if we try to build up systems and structures and actions that kind of say, no, you've got to get to God. And oh, by the way, here's the hoops. Here's the checklist. Oh, and I'm sorry, some of you are already disqualified because of fill in the blank. God loves you, but, or if, or when. Which then reduces us back to even before there was a temple. How do I know I have enough faith? Well, obviously I don't. How do I know I'm doing enough? I, against what? These people tell me no.
When Jesus was crucified, it talks about the fact that the curtain in the temple, the curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom. That that which separated God from the rest of the people was ripped open. In his baptism, these heavens were torn open and the dove came down. In the temple, Jesus kicks over some tables and flogs some people for the same reason. The distance between God and humanity is now zero. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom is near. Repent and believe the good news as he proclaimed in Mark. 1,500 years later, a young German monk decided to get up and go, wait a minute, folks, at what point are we not repeating history? As we make it about what you do, or who you are, and how much you can afford to be forgiven. What about this grace? Grace. And here we are 500 years later. Are we still going and doing that? Are we still holding other people up to rules, regulations, expectations that honestly if the roles were reversed, we couldn't? If we were in their shoes if we were amongst them like the word that became flesh became amongst us love your neighbor as yourself C.S. Lewis once said that of course you have to forgive the inexcusable in others because God forgave the inexcusable in you. Jesus came and overthrew the temple to remind us that there is no difference, no variation. As Paul would later write, no longer slave or free, Gentile or Jew, male or female, all are one in Christ. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And we're called to share that, to show that, to dare to love, to dare to love the unlovable, because God loved the unlovable in us. And yes, let's face it, that isn't necessarily popular. It got Jesus crucified. But he did tell us to take up a cross and follow. And more importantly, we also know the cross wasn't the end. It was another beginning. Not out of anger, not out of spite, but out of love. So remember that God loves you, and so do I. Amen.